I'd like to focus on a couple of areas. One, advice you might give to a bookseller. And second of all, talking to them about how they might go about selling your books. Well, how they might go selling my books doesn't interest me because the book that's coming out, the book about books, mostly a book about book selling, I don't know if there'll be any more books after that. That's my 41st book. I don't really have plans to write many more. I will do essays and reviews and bell letters belletristic stuff, but I don't have any more novels for them to sell. Okay, well, can we focus on the book about books then, and, and what okay. you've got in there about how to sell books? My philosophy about how to sell books has always been extremely simple. Have the right books. Have the right kind of books. Have books that are attractive and appealing. And I've never made any effort, any real sales effort. Put the right books on the shelf. And at least up till recently, people will take them off the shelf and buy them. In fact, I've read that of the hundreds of thousands of books that you've got in your stores, you've pretty well hand-picked all of them to, right. ma to make sure there's no junk in there. That's right. That's the major pro problem with large general bookstores. Junk, junk tends to creep in. So to the, to the extent that I can, I open every box and decide what goes on the floor and what is downstream. So you say that picking the right book, now that would, that would also hold true for, for, obviously, for the retailer, the new book sales. Right, uh, it would hold true for anyone. I mean, if the, usually the taste of the bookseller is represented by the books on the shelf that sells books. Sometimes, though, I mean, and maybe often, that doesn't correspond to the taste of the people that are coming in the bookstore. It pretty much does, in my case. Uh, we've always been able to sell our kind of book, and it's, that's a broad, broad category. Anything attractive in any of the areas of the humanities is have to be our kind of book. So, you know, we have literature and philosophy and cookbooks and children's books and history and psychology and hunting, and we have all the categories of a general humanistic bookshop. And we try to have attractive copies in the right condition, at a modest price. What has happened in the antiquarian book trade, I don't know anything about the new book trade. I've never been involved in the new book trade at all. What has happened is that the high end is very saleable. Books over $100,000 you can sell with a snap of your finger. It's selling the good $25, $25 to $50 books that has become hard. You mentioned picking good books. Can you give me a, a, a just a, a selection of the authors that you generally tend to seek out? Not really, because there are hundreds of them in dozens of fields. Okay, let me let I, me. I have very good travel books. By all, by very good poetry, very good literature, very good philosophy, very good anthropology, very good music, musical biography, very very good bibliography and books about books. There are just hundreds. Okay, there's a general responsiveness to the level of the stock and the reason we're not keen about being on the internet is because on the internet people have a tendency to look for a particular book but if they come to Archer City maybe they're looking for a particular book but they're apt to see all these hand, these nice books and buy 20 or 30 books that they hadn't expected to buy. Yes, exactly, yeah. It's it's part of the, the fun, it's the hunt and coming right. across things that you wouldn't expect to find. That's right, or yeah. that you'd always wanted, and here it is, suddenly you're faced with it. Now, speaking of the treasure hunt, you uh, started off as a, a book scout back in almost, 19... Almost all booksellers start as book scouts. I mean, you know, they. I started doing it to finance my reading, which is extensive, and then I discovered I could sell books that I didn't want to read and buy books I did want to read. Yeah. So in a large way, it still, it still finances my reading. Yes. And you put out your first catalog in 1962. Uh, I believe I did. It's kind of fanciful to call it a catalog since it was just one sheet of paper listing six collections that I bought from a bookseller in San Francisco. I don't really like the catalog. It's booked up in its 37-year history. It's only issued two catalogs. Okay. <laughs> uh, and But that both times because we happened to run into a bunch of the particularly catalogable books. Getting back to the Internet, could you explain why it is you uh, haven't gone on the Internet? Well, I myself am anti-computer. I've never used a computer or even turned one on. Right. 
uh, our, our manager can use a computer, Crystal Collins. We have an awful lot of books. Putting them online would take a long time. And uh, we do have a young bookseller that's moved to town. Uh, two or three booksellers sort of work our stock on the internet, which is fine. That's part of what would make Archer City a book town. And Crystal has begun to put books online. Okay. Uh, that's mainly because of there's not that much to do in the shop if you don't put things online. Y- yes, yes. It's, it's a big slump time just to have something to do. You put books online. But it's never, never, it just never interested me. Uh, it never interested me either as a writer or a bookseller. So I haven't paid much attention to it. How, how is Archer City going these days? Well, uh, it's about breaking even. And that's about the most I expect it to do unless there's another real change. We were a very active bookshop selling nearly a million dollars worth of books a year out of a small, out of the four buildings in a small remote town. And that stopped in April of 2001 with the dot-com bubble bursting. Yeah. And many of our customers have never come back. For one thing, the dealers stopped traveling. They stopped, of course, they began to be able to find books on the Internet, not the tradition of going around visiting dealers began to die. Also, we had a tremendous snowbird traffic of people going to the Gulf Coast for the winter from the upper Midwest and stopping through for a day or two to buy books. That died like instantly. So our drop was 90%. Our revenue drop in the next couple of years was 90%. Oh, my goodness. It has come back a little bit. We haven't come back to the million-dollar level, but we've we've come back to where it's sustainable. Some years it, it does, it's not going to make a lot of money, but it's not going to absorb a lot of money either. It sort of pays for itself. Yes, because you had... Uh amused about closing is a year or two back. Well, that was very brief. What I really wanted to do was to be appointment only, but that doesn't work in a small, remote book town. People don't know that you're by appointment only and they drive 500 miles. We never closed. We were actually never closed. We contemplated it for two or three weeks and tested the water, and but we never got around to being closed. And We tried the appointment only only for a couple of weeks, and we saw that it wasn't going to work, and so we were open regular hours, six days. Are there new uh, bookstores uh, coming into town, like of setting up? Well, we have three. There's the three. There's us. Then there's a, a company called Three Dog Books that's owned by a young couple. Uh, I brought the young lady there to work and booked up from Bar- She worked for Barters in Tucson, and this is Julie and Cody Russell. She worked for us six or seven years. Then she married and she got her own business, and they got their own business. They bought some duplicates from me and started off, and they do pretty well. They work the internet very, very hard. So you're not quite in the league of hey on why yet, then? And we're not going to be there, but we did get our third bookseller just about a month ago, a young man who's been scouting for us for years, and I guess he decided he would rather scout from Archer City as a base than he can do Dallas and Fort Worth and which stuff off and garage sales and estate sales, which we just don't have time to cover, but which he owe very good books sometimes. Yes, yes. So he, we gave him an office, and he um, will work our books online, and he will also still scout for us. So we said we consider it all told that there are three of us now, better yeah. than two, better than one. It, it just happened at a time when it might have been possible to lure a few dealers to have a, have a booth or something from Fort Worth and Dallas just at the time of the downturn, and they didn't want to. Okay. So, unfortunately. What about a festival? Do you have a festival like Hey on Why? Oh, I don't want that. No. <laughs> That's the last thing I'd want. Okay. Actually, what has happened uh, inadvertently, not connected to the book business, is that Archer City has become a kind of seminar, a seminar town. And in the summer, because, the, you know, the Royal Theater got restored, and for a time I had a little center financed by someone else in which we had acting classes and writing classes for about three weeks in the summer. I am no longer involved with this, but it's still happening. There are two different groups that come down, at least two different groups that come down every summer for about ten days. Hmm. And mostly I think now it's writing classes. What about setting up a, a little book collecting seminar? Well, there's a book collecting, there's a couple of book collecting professionals, you know, and one of them has held a seminar in Archer City with our, with
with our blessings. It's just a one-day seminar. Uh, of course, there's a the big one in Denver uh, that happens every year. That's the most famous. But there is a guy that goes from city to city and uh, does uh, book collecting seminars. Now, you uh, co-wrote the screenplay to Brokeback Mountain. I did. And your acceptance speech at the Oscars included a thank you to all of the booksellers in the world uh, as a wonderful culture we must not lose. Could you expand on that? Well, I think it's clear, you know, I wanted this to give the boost to the booksellers who, who you know, I've spent my whole life, my whole adult life, uh, mostly in antiquarian booksellers, bookshops, and I've derived an immense amount of pleasure from it. I also think it's culturally vital to have good second-hand bookshops. Why is that? Well, but otherwise we'll have a totally illiterate public. I mean, I think second-hand bookshops are, are necessary to the culture, otherwise it'll be a dumber and dumber culture, which I started to say at the Oscar, and which it already is, of course. It's getting dumber all the time. What are your thoughts about the future of the book reading? Well, I don't know quite what to think. I, I asked my grandson, who's 17, who was a big reader, and I don't know, and I think he still reads a good bit. I really don't know. I know that the, the effect of the change on the second-hand book business mainly is that because the chains sell music. And kids go to those stores to buy music, not books. Sometimes they buy books too, but they go to buy movie videos and music. And we don't, we don't have any young customers, which is disheartening. Loyal customers, but they're sort of middle-aged people and older. Interesting. And we don't have any young collectors. There are young collectors, but they haven't shown up in Archer City yet. There's a, a lovely line in your book, Walter Benjamin and the Dairy Queen, about you being a book rancher, herding books into larger and larger ranches. Well, it's kind of like, uh, it is a form, I consider it a form of herding, because I'm from a herdsman tradition. All of my, my father and all, all of my eight uncles were cattlemen, so it's, the herding tradition is, you could say that writing is a form of herding, too, in those words and the paragraphs and such. You know, it's interesting. I read uh, recently a line by uh, the British poet Ted Hughes who talked about poetry. Writing poetry is the same as what he did when he was a little kid, which is running around chasing mice and putting them into his pockets. Right. There's some analogies that are clear. You mentioned, too, to, uh, the idea of keeping your stock fresh by continually buying new books. Yeah, buying is like breathing to the book trade. It's like breathing. Even if we're stuck in a small, tiny town, and even if only we only have seven or eight regulars who show up two or three times a week, they want to see something new. Maybe 50 books. It may be some that you don't want a stagnant stock. You always want to be adding to it. Scout every day here in Tucson. Every day I go to the bookshops. Oh, do you? Yes, every day. Part of my rhythm. Isn't that lovely? So how many do you go to? Well, I go to one, essentially, most of the time. It's a wonderful shop called The Book Stop, uh -huh. D-O-P, one word. And uh, I, go to, I go there right after lunch or up before lunch because they buy a lot across the counter, and I go there to see what's come in. So you always go to the new arrival section? That's right. And you go there because for your own collection or for purchasing? No, for mostly, mostly for uh, books to send to Archer City, so there'll be something fresh on the shelves. I occasionally will, of course, buy a book for myself, but most, most of what I buy is books bought for resale. Now, you have a personal library of some 20,000 books. Closer to 30. 30,000 books. 28, I think, is where we are now. Okay. Do you have a particular author that you like to collect? I don't really collect. I, I'm a, what in the book trade is called an accumulator. I accumulate books that I want to read, and sometimes, you know, maybe I'll want to read about the First World War, and I'll get 200 books about the First World War. There are certainly thousands, but I'm an accumulator. I don't farm collections, really. I, I occasionally buy and sell collections, but I don't mainly farm them. I have acquired, sort of by accident, uh, a couple of collections that I acquired because they're detachable. They're not really part of my library, and that's if I fell dead and my son needed $100,000 very quick, he could sell these collections and get it. So you're not going to, you, you must have a favorite author or a handful. No, I don't. 
You don't? <laughs> no, I don't. If I did, they'd be meaningless. They'd be little travel writers or something, but uh, I don't. I haven't read fiction in a very long time. Okay. Because I reviewed it for 10 years, 15 years, and I just suddenly burned out on it. I didn't want to read fiction anymore, and I haven't. Yeah, I think you do talk elsewhere about burning out on... Yeah, you just, you don't want to, you don't want to spend the afternoon doing the things you do for a living in the morning. So I don't want to write fiction half a day and read it the other half. I want to read memoirs or military history or something different. I think I saw you on Charlie Rose talking about how you burnt out on movies. For, that, for the same reason, except that but for working on them so long. Yeah. I've worked on movies a long time, nearly 50 years. Just getting back to uh, advice then to, uh, let, let's say that, again, I know your expertise is antiquarian, but let's say that, that a, a young couple has just decided to open up a, a new bookstore. Uh, what kind of advice would you give them? Oh, I'd tell them not to do it. I would advise against it. I don't know anything about the new book business. It's never interested me. So that's a different, that's a different world entirely. Certain things that you pick up inevitably from being a published author, but I've never... I wouldn't ever advise a young couple going into the new book business. Are I you would encourage people to go into the used book business because I think it will come back and flourish again. Oh, you do? But I don't know about new books. I just don't know anything about them. I understand. Okay. Why do you think that, uh, that the used books are going to start flourishing again? Well, it's a very conservative thing. People have been taking books off shelves and browsing in them and reading them. And people, um, book buyers, like, they like the culture. They like to talk to the bookseller and haggle and stuff like that. And I think it's a deep instinct, and I think it will survive. Uh, do you have some favorite bookstores other than the one you mentioned? Well, almost all of them are dying. They're dying like flies. Uh, right now, I suppose Serendipity in Berkeley would be my favorite bookstore. And why is that? That's a great bookstore. Just because of the selection? It's also still there. <laughs> no, I'm an old, old customer of the Heritage Bookshop in Los Angeles. I mean, I knew the Heritage Boys, the Weinsteins, from the time they uh, came to town as junk dealers. They closed down, though, didn't they? <laughs> what I mean. The when I first went to Hollywood to screenwrite, there were 115 second-hand bookshops between Long Beach and, say, Ventura. And there are hardly any. I, have, I go to Los Angeles frequently. I don't know where to go. There's no place to go. The heritage is gone. The heritage is gone. Charlie Saltzman is gone. The excitement is gone. Uh, all of the the whole body of bookshops along Hollywood Boulevard are gone. Uh, you know, it's it's just gone. There are one or two uh, by appointment only dealers that I might go see, but it's really gone. Selling books in L.A. is not there anymore. And the same thing's happening in New York too. Well, the same. I, to my mind, New York was always a more difficult um, place because, of course, it was broken into smaller pieces. You had to go in this building and up this, these, this elevator and in this building and up this elevator. That's been the way it is for a long time, except for the Strand. And uh, the Strand and Serendipity and Pals in Portland and Mr. King in Detroit, those are about what's left of the large bookshops. And I guess the Brattle in Boston, I don't know what state they're in. I haven't been there in a long time. I was there just uh, this last summer, and they seem to be doing pretty well. Well, they, may, they probably are doing pretty well. But there's a handful, there's less than a dozen, that I could count on if I were going to a city, if I were going to Chicago, or if I were going to Philadelphia, that I would automatically go to a certain bookshop. There's about a dozen, maybe, uh, nationwide. But you're, you're optimistic? The bookshop I was in in Canada was David Mason's a long time ago when he was, I believe, in his first location. David Mason, Stephen Temple's still around. Yeah, that's been a big fall off. But you're optimistic about the future, though? Well, cautiously. Uh, undoubtedly, a lot of people are going to wipe out. We've bought the stock of 30 bookshops about so far. Our large portions of the stock of 30 bookshops. And I don't have any notion. I could be completely wrong. Maybe it'll never come back. But for the moment, we get enough response to encourage me. To I just can't imagine not having a bookshop. And so uh, this one is going to tickle along. I thank you very much for uh, You're welcome for sharing your thoughts with us. And uh, and and best of luck. And thanks again for spending time with us. You're very welcome. Good to talk. Okay. Bye, Larry. Bye.